everybody. This is Marcus popping in for a quick chat with you about dialogue today. Uh, we're all professional screenwriters here at the script department, so sometimes it's quite nice to uh, take a, a quick step back and have a look at some of the technical bits of screenwriting. And today, I'm going to do just that when we have a look at the structure of dialogue, specifically how you can use the three-act structure to enhance your character's words. And I'm going to be using a case study for this one today, so uh, have, a, have a look at the end of this. So um, those of you that are regular consumers of script department content will know that I'm a big science fiction fan. Specifically, you may know that I very much enjoy a bit of Doctor Who. Um, I know, surprising, isn't it? So I'm going to ask you today to join me in my screenwriting TARDIS as we head back to 2005. 26th of March 2005 to be specific, Doctor Who crashes into the modern world with the Russell T Davies penned robes. This is an episode with an awful lot to do. We could pick apart this episode in terms of how it bridges the gap between classical Doctor Who and what will become Doctor Who after this episode. We could talk about how skillfully Russell T Davies introduces the new tone of the show. Uh, we could talk about the characterization of Rose Tyler, how she immediately grabs the attention of the audience and we feel uh, as though she is uh, an audience surrogate in a way that is both familiar and totally fresh in the world of Doctor Who. And perhaps we will one day, perhaps we should one day, because all of this stuff is really, really good. But today I want to focus on one bit of dialogue, not just a scene, specifically a set of lines of dialogue within a scene. And here I turn to this. This is a very old book, not very old, but quite old for me. This is a book that I've had since I was about 14 years old, uh, Doctor Who, the shooting scripts from 2005. And these are the first, interestingly, actually, these are the first screenplays I ever read. That's nice, isn't it? Nice screenplays for me. Um, and I'm reading now, I'm turning to page 25. So if you do actually have this book, I think many of you probably will, you can turn there as well. Um, now, this little moment is not the first time we've seen this new Doctor on screen. It's not the first time we've seen the Doctor do something dramatic on screen. It's not the first time he meets Rose. It's not a profoundly exciting chase through London. It's not bursting into the TARDIS for the first time. It's, it's nothing like that. It's something far more subtle. And I think a lot more important. So for those of you who are fans already, you may know what I'm talking about here. And I'm going to read this passage for you now because it's only short. Um, but if you are interested in watching it, and I absolutely suggest that you do this um, rather than just listen to me say it, you can go to BBC iPlayer and find episode one, series one of Doctor Who on there. And if you're outside of the UK, it's often available on uh, Netflix or BBC America, places like that. And you're looking for 15 minutes, 33 seconds. And this moment goes a little bit like this. And this is the Doctor speaking, by the way. Do you know, like we were saying about the Earth revolving? It's like when you're a kid, the first time they tell you the world is turning and you can't quite believe it because everything looks like it's standing still. I can feel it. The turn of the Earth. The ground beneath our feet is spinning at a thousand miles an hour. The entire planet is hurtling around the sun at 67,000 miles an hour, and I can feel it. We're falling through space, you and me, clinging to the skin of this tiny little world, and if we let go, that's who I am. Now forget me, Rose Tyler. Go home. Please excuse the uh, slightly poor performance from me there, but like I say, go and watch it, because you'll get a lot more out of it that way. Um... So what's so important about this? Why is this so important, this particular patch of dialogue? Well, let's do a bit of a, a dive in on this analysis here, because there's a lot to look at. But firstly, I think you need to look at what this dialogue has to do, what it's attempting to do. If you look at the longer scene here, then you'll find that Rose is bombarding the Doctor with questions about who he is. Remember, we're introducing Doctor Who to the audience for the first time, potentially, and readjusting uh, people's expectations of who the Doctor is. So there's going to be a lot of this in this episode. It has to introduce him. So this is what we're doing here. She's bombarding him. She's going, who are you? What does this mean? What does that mean? And he answers a few of these questions. He evades some of them and bluntly refuses to answer a couple of them. And Rose is unsatisfied with these responses, as she's supposed to be, as we are as the audience. And what's interesting is that he does give direct answer to these questions that she's asking him in a really direct way. But we don't get the feeling of who he is. And the fact is, normal words just don't do this character justice. They don't tell us anything about him, really. 
And so she asks him again, and this time we get this piece of dialogue. Now, the golden rule of screenwriting is show, don't tell. What this line does is hold up that idea through words. We are shown who the Doctor is, the alien nature of his existence, the amazement at the wonders he's able to see and feel, the humanity, the fear of what he can witness, the loneliness because he can't share it. This speech shows us who the Doctor is. Notice that he doesn't talk about seeing remarkable sunsets. We get a lot of this in in later years, the Doctor pontificating on the wonderful things he's seen and things like that. We don't get this from this Doctor. We don't get him talking about amazing sunsets, uh, phenomenal supernovas, anything like that. He's talking about feeling things. And at that, something quite mundane. He's talking about feeling the turn of the Earth, which is at once profound and ordinary. The choice of subject for this little sequence of dialogue is perfect because it's entirely infathomable to us as the audience and human race, and yet we recognise it, just like the Doctor. We've been shown who he is, not told who he is. So let's dive a little bit deeper into this and look at the structure. Now, three-act structure is a well-known idea within screenwriting and storytelling generally. And this sequence is a great example of how you use that in delivering dialogue. Three-act structure is not just for entire episodes, entire films, or entire narratives. It can be used very effectively in scenes and, and little tiny moments. So we are going to look again, and we're going to dissect where these transitions are. So, do you know, like we were saying about the Earth revolving... He's reminding us of something that's happened before. You remember that? You remember what we're saying about this? We're home. We're back where we started. This is where we are. It's like when you're a kid. The first time you fe- they tell you the earth is turning, and you can't quite believe it because everything looks like it's standing still. We're amping up the idea. We're leading towards something. He's making a point, and we are interested in what it is. So we, we are being suggested that maybe we're going to go on a journey. I can feel it. Okay. Act two, call to adventure. We are on our way now. I can feel it. He is taking us somewhere. We have accepted this journey and we're on our way. I can feel it. The turn of the earth. The ground beneath our feet is spinning at a a thousand miles an hour. The entire planet is hurtling around the sun at 67,000 miles an hour. We're upping the drama. We're upping the tension. It's going quicker. And I can feel it. We're falling through space. You and me clinging to the skin of this tiny little world. And if we let go... Act three. That's who I am. Now forget me, Rose Tyler. Go home. And we have act three again. It's perfect three-act structure. The Doctor is taking Rose on an adventure in this piece of dialogue. He is showing her who he is in one speech. It shakes her, it unnerves her, and it's made all the more effective because of this structure. We have increasing tension throughout the first part. He relates it back to something she recognises. She's home, it's familiar. Uh, We then cross into the second act with this call to action. I can feel it. Here we go. We're crossing into the second act. He amps up and amps up and amps up. And we get to this crescendo if we let go. Then the third act, descending tension, descending drama. Now forget me, Rose Tyler, go home. Go home is so important there because it is literally what you do at the end of the third act. Or the third act, rather. Campbell's hero's journey starts at home and ends at home. We begin here by saying the earth is revolving, we're on the journey, and we come back again, home changed. Rose is different after this speech, and she is the audience surrogate, so we are different after this speech. We can't go back to the time before we knew about this character. We can't go back to a time of innocence anymore, when we didn't know of the dramatic depths of this character. And that's what this story is. We begin at home, we go through our story, and we return home different. Applying ideas like Campbell's Hero's Journey, three-act structure, um, just the golden rule, showing and not telling, to your pieces of dialogue can only enhance your writing. So often when I'm tutoring or when I've got scripts coming through the door to be through the door, where of, <laughs> what, what age are we living in? Through the mailbox, whatever it is, um, for people asking for notes and things like that, the dialogue is just thrown away. It's it's just exposition to get us onto the next big exciting thing. This is exposition, right? This is exposition. This gives us an insight into the character we're going to follow for the next 20 odd years. But it's done in an artistic and nuanced way. It's showing us, it's not telling us. 
it's using that structure. And if you're looking to improve that your dialogue, look at wider theory and see if you can apply these ideas in places where you may not ordinarily expect them to be applied. And for the record as well, Russell T. Davies is a master of dialogue. I suggest you go and look at anything you can get your hands on from Russell T. Davies. Uh, it's a sin, years and years, Doctor Who, whatever it might be, go look at it. It's it's, it's great stuff. Uh, and this book is very good as well. It gives you a good insight into those things. So yeah, I really hope you enjoyed that today. This is a bit of a different kind of video uh, from us uh, that you might be used to. It's a little bit more of a deep dive, a little bit more screenwriter nerd stuff. Um, but I, I think it's fun to look at the theory behind things sometimes and and kind of really look into things. Uh, we, you know, we, we cover a lot of ground in our review videos and talking about other films, but sometimes I think it's really nice to focus in on stuff. So let us know. If you enjoyed this, uh, then maybe we can do some more of these in the future. And uh, yeah, should be good. As always, please remember to check out what we're doing over at the scriptdepartment.net. Our global screenwriters, uh, the network of screenwriters are always busy over there. Um, and yeah, remember to like, subscribe, have a look at our previous videos, and uh, hopefully you like what you saw today. So if you want to improve your craft, read screenplays, and listen to the script department. Bye-bye. <laughs>